What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today, we're looking at Exodus 31, 32, and 33, and then we're finishing Matthew 22 in the New Testament. And there is so much good for us to read today. These are very famous chapters. A lot of the important things are happening here. First of all, chapter 31, what we see is God empowers some people to build all the things that have just been described. So later on in the book of Exodus, we're going to see how they build them. But he empowers people with his spirit to build this place for God. And then he tells the whole community, make sure that you keep my Sabbaths. Make sure you keep my Sabbaths. And that might go over our heads as thinking, okay, yeah, well, on to the next thing. That's very important because the people will oftentimes in Israel's history be very guilty of neglecting to listen to God and not obeying his Sabbaths. Very important that we keep God's Sabbaths here as Israelite community here. And then he tells them, make sure you do it. Then chapter 32, the worst thing that happened so far in the book of Exodus for the people of Israel, we see when Moses was delayed and he was up on the mountain for a long time. It says the people gathered around to Aaron and they said to him, up. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. It's been days and days and days. He might be dead. Aaron, why don't you make us some gods that can go before us? And Aaron takes this gold that is collected from the community. He makes these this golden calf, this small cow that's made out of gold, and they all bow down and worship it. And the interesting thing that they say about it is they say, behold, these are your gods. This is verse number four. It says they took the gold, they put it together, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow will be a feast to the Lord. Right, again, it's weird. The Lord? Uh, Yahweh? Yeah, yeah, it says that. It says this is Yahweh. So here, here's what the people were doing. They were saying, we want a visual representation of God because we don't like how God has been invisible. We don't like that God is showing his glory to Moses. We want to, to worship God in some tangible way. So let's build an idol to represent Yahweh, the Lord. Here's the problem. God has already said they're not allowed to do that. Do not make any idols. Don't make any visual representations of the Lord. This is not a different God. Think about it. They're not saying we want to worship a different God. They're saying we want to worship the Lord, the real God, through this. And God says, I hate that. Don't do that. So sometimes we are mistaken. We think, oh, well, they're, they're turning to some other God. In effect, they are. I mean, obviously, this is idolatry. God says, don't do this. But they're claiming that this is the Lord. Just an interesting point that you keep in mind. It says, when this happened, Moses is informed by God, look at all these people, what they're doing. Um, they, they're not only worshiping this false God, it says earlier, they rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play, which is a carbon copy of what you find in Canaanite worship. When you have these false gods, what they do is there's always feasting involved, there's always drunkenness involved, and then there's always sexual immorality involved. And that's what the people are doing. Do you see why God repeatedly warns them? Don't be like the cultures around you. Take out their gods. Don't be like them at all because if you're like the other gods, you'll do this kind of stuff. And Moses finds out, God tells him, he gets mad, they go down. Um, he takes the, the tablets and in anger, it says, his anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and he broke them at the foot of the mountain and he made that big golden calf. He ground it down to the gold, to dust, and then he scattered it in their water and he made them drink it. And that's how mad Moses got. Um, and then, then Moses says, hey, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. Who's on the Lord's side? And all the sons of Levi, the people from the tribe of Levi, gathered around him. And they said, thus says the Lord God, put your sword on your side, each one of you, and go to and fro from the gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell that day about 3,000 men. Think about how crazy this is. The Levites rise up and God says, go kill all the people that were committing this sexual immorality. Go kill all the people who were engaging in this idolatry. Go kill them. And he does. And then you'd think, wow, is God really for that? Well, it says, yes, these people are set up as now they're going to be the priests. They're going to be God's special group of people because they obeyed God on a day when nobody obeyed him. It's interesting, if you remember the promises to the Levites earlier in Genesis 49, they were not a very highly favored group. Remember, Levi and Simeon were violent guys. They did what was what was wrong with the, with the Shechem situation that we saw earlier in the book of Genesis. 
That's promised again in Genesis 49, that's referenced, but now we see in one day, everything changes for the Levites because they stand up for God when nobody else does. Interesting and helpful reminder for us, even if no one else is standing up for God, we need to do the right thing and stand up for the Lord. Now, you might think, wow, that was a lot of things. Well, there was a lot of things, but chapter 33 goes even further. Moses is talking to God, and God says to Moses, you go ahead, you go with these people. I'm not coming with you, because if I come with you, I'm going to put these people to death because they're so unholy. And Moses says, no, God, if you don't come with us, we're not going to go. We cannot go into the land without you. And God says, okay, I'll go. My presence will go. And then Moses keeps asking, and he asks God, show me your glory. I want to see who you are. Show me more of yourself. You showed me on the burning bush. You showed me on the mountain. Show me more. Moses has this godly desire to know God more. God says, you can't even see my fullness or you'll die. But in this mysterious way, he hides Moses in this rock and then he shows himself um, in in great glory. He shows who he is, but he doesn't even show his face. It's like, he shows the the back of him. It's not like, you can't even see God in his fullness because if you do, you'll die. Um, And then after this, God answer his prayer. Um, And we're going to see tomorrow what God says. So it's a bummer we're reading chapter 33 and not 34, but there's so much that we're going to talk about tomorrow about what God says about himself. So that's our Old Testament reading. In the New Testament, we're looking at the middle of Matthew chapter 22. We already saw the Herodians ask Jesus a question. Now we're going to see the Sadducees are going to ask Jesus a question. Then the Pharisees are going to ask a question. Then Jesus is going to ask his own question to everybody. So what's the question of the Sadducees? They come up with this situation where there's a scene where this person um, has a gets married and then one of them dies and then gets married again and then one of them dies and gets married again and one of them dies and the question is at the end in the resurrection therefore of the seven who will the wife be a wife to like who's who's going to be married um, to this lady because she married seven husbands and seven husbands died Um, and Jesus says you don't get it it's not like that. We're not going to be married or given in marriage. But don't you know that the law says, and the reason the law is important, is the Sadducees were the theologically liberal group, which means they didn't respect the Bible highly. They looked down on the Bible. And they only really embraced the first five books. They did not listen to David. They did not listen to Daniel. They didn't listen to Jeremiah or Isaiah. They only listened to the book of Moses. So Jesus goes back to the book of Moses and he says, does not the law already say that when God speaks, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So the people, the idea is, When God said those things, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham when he was alive, but now he's gone. He says, I am the God of Abraham right now. I am the same God, and Abraham is still around. So Jesus makes that clear from the law. Then the Pharisees ask a question, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, that's that's an easy question. This is a good question. He says, the the greatest commandment is Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He says, this is the great and first commandment. Second greatest commandment is similar, Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do those things, love God with all your heart, and then love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to be fulfilling the law. If those two things are your guiding principles, you're going to do what God's law tells you to do. Then Jesus says, all right, guys, you've asked me three different rounds of questions, Herodians, Sadducees, Pharisees. Now, I've got a question for all of you. What do you make of Psalm 110 verse 1, where David says, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under your feet. So what is he saying? There's three characters there. There's the Lord, there's David's Lord, and there's David. Who is David's Lord? And that's what he asks. He says, how can David call him Lord if he's just the son? Right? Clearly that was talking about Messiah, but how can Messiah just be son of David and not also David's Lord? And look what Jesus is asking. He's saying, this is talking about me. What are you going to say about me? Who do you say that I am? That's the question that Jesus is asking again, which as we read the book of Matthew, we need to constantly be reminded Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of God. He's the Lord. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. And he's the God that Moses talked to at the burning bush on the Mount Sinai and also when he shows him his glory. That's Jesus. So awesome to see Jesus proving his divinity over and over again. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.